G'day, welcome back to Project Brewpeg, story of a sunken fishing trawler converting into a global expedition and research boat. This episode is all about getting the internal pipe work for the fuel tank sorted with our stainless pipes that go through Jess's editing studio and also replacing part of a rusty rib that we cut out. Surprisingly, this episode also is a little plain. Island not far from here called Fraser Island which has basically been on fire um, and uh, it's been pretty difficult for them to put it out it's a lot of remote areas hard to get to all that sort of stuff um, and they've had in Aussie we don't really have a lot of fire bombing planes and equipment and things like that they're using things like top dressing planes to dump as much water as they can but recently they brought in a, um, a Q400 uh, water bomber from Canada and we luckily got to meet one of the pilots Dave he's a viewer of ours and he offered to take us on a bit of a tour of the plane so I mean it's pretty interesting and I thought you know you guys might be interested in it as well um, so yeah we're gonna go and have a bit of a gander around a Q400 water bombing fire plane we're down at the airport and one of our viewers Dave is an aerial firefighter this plane behind me is the plane that he flies to fight the fires that are happening in Aussie at the moment so Fraser Island is a fire that's been burning for a couple of months um, it's a standard Q400 that's been modified with a drop tank underneath, belly tank, and it dumps 10 ton in a, you know, per go. They can create, he was saying, a, a line of retardant that's 20 meters wide, or what's that, 60 feet, by 400 meters, um, quarter mile for those that use hieroglyphics. And um, they can do, at the moment they're based about 10 minutes away from the fire, it takes them 10 minutes to load, so every 30 minutes they're creating um, fire breaks like that. And uh, yeah, let me show you around this plane. It's pretty cool. Clear. Clear. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Underneath, you've got a belly tank stuck onto this plane, and then down below, you've got two. Two, two valves basically, two doors that open up and dump it straight out and you've got um, hydraulics that control that. So then inside, it's a stripped out standard plane. You can see basically everything, they gut it so that they've got as much weight out as possible. So I'll spin around looking forward. So you can see the wing above us here. So in the plane, you've got these big frames. You've got one here on the, on the aft end of the wing and one on the front of the wing, the forward edge. And then the tank itself is held on by these couple of big brackets here. One set there, one set here. And that's duplicated over the other side. You can see you've got one here and one there. Up front. Aussie, Aussie has some specific radio rules, so that's a setup that's basically designed to allow them to communicate in certain Australian states and that'll come out when they go back to Canada. So when I was building my um, pentagraph hinges this is basically what I had in my head and admittedly mine didn't quite turn out like this. Yeah that's pretty cool. So, so your gas struts and then you've got an adjustable control rod to control the rotation of this beam haven't you? This goes straight up. Oh right okay. This one. Yeah right. This one here is in the service bar, so it, it goes out. Out slightly and then swing. Mm. That's much more like what we were trying to build. Right, and then down. It's all about the geometry, isn't it? Right, so you've got your control rods at the top. I'm about to modify mine again, so it's actually really handy. Right, so you've got your two rods here, and you've got your main beam here. The thing that I did learn was that the distance between those pins has to be identical on all three. I didn't realise it. Yeah, I didn't realise it when I first started building it. Mm. And this one doesn't swing up, it's because it's a service. So what would happen is that, um, you know, a service truck with, with galley supplies would drive up. Yep and they just need to swing it out of the way. Yeah, right. So does that lock out the way like that? 
Or is it just held there? It's got a little catch here, just a little. Ah, right, I see. Ah, right. So that there. Ah, I see, right. That is awesome. They were saying the floor panels they're using here is a like a honeycomb carbon fiber floor panel. Like all of the black ones are honeycomb carbon fiber. And then down the back where you'd have the galley is a glass reinforced plastic. Um, like obviously a bit hardier and so on, but also heavier. These are pretty light, that's why they leave them in here. Yeah, they don't get the syrup tainers, it is absolutely amazing. So it just does everything well. Mm. And uh, you know, it's everything from efficient to fast and and uh, you know you can use a lot of different runways and this is the multi-tool air tankers this is the infrastructure that they've quickly put together to belt out this fire so it's basically they get retardant over here which is um very similar to fertilizer but it's basically like a gel some of the stuff that they, i think that's correct is like a gel and it, it helps the rather than just evaporate the water evaporates faster if you don't have it and it keeps it on the ground so that it actually does its job so they mix it in 50 liters per 10,000 liters and they have these tanks here to obviously because the mains can't supply enough so they have these tanks to accumulate it and then they can belt it straight into the plane in uh, around 10 minutes they were saying between landing and then taking off again there you have it ever anyone wondering how to water their tomatoes in a highly efficient way see if you can get one of these for a season Thanks for the tour, Dave, and thanks for all your amazing firefighting. It was really nice to meet you, and thanks, Teresa, for organising it. Running a YouTube channel, you get pretty used to people saying stuff. You get a thick skin after a while, it's kind of water off a duck's back, it really doesn't matter. But every now and again, something does get said that, that really bites home. Recently, one YouTube channel, which, which shall remain nameless, but there is a link in the description if you'd like to subscribe to them, said some strong words about our engine. Yeah, and we had a little phone call with Damien today and uh, you're going to get into Blue's Cummins out. Yeah, the Cummins is going. <laughs> I've decided that he definitely shouldn't have a Cummins in brew pen. Something along the lines of, you should get a Detroit, get rid of that Cummins. And, you know, that's, some things just can't be unsaid. Our Cummins is made in Great Britain, the land of the stiff upper lip, the moustache, and a lot of tea. Detroit's, on the other hand, were designed in the 1850s as a replacement for horse and cart. Their primary role was to turn diesel into noise. This was something that a lot of people liked at the time. It seemed new and fandangled. If you or anyone you know is suffering from Detroit, you don't have to suffer alone and suffer in silence. There are trained professionals that can help. There's a number on the screen below where you can call 24 hours a day and professionals will be there to take your call. Brewpeg cares, because Cummins care. Konbanwa, hola, konnichiwa, kia ora. Welcome to Brewpeg. We've got quite a bit of stuff going on this morning. These are the stainless discs that we need to cut out uh, for the for the deck and for the um, top of the tank. So Jess plasmed these out. Um, this is a five inch disc and we basically needed five inch circles exactly what she's made there. So um, we'll go through now and we'll clean up the edges like you can sort of see the sort of dags and stuff that you get from the plasma. We're going to go through and just grind them up so that they're a nice sort of true circle but she's cut it bloody close to the line which is perfect we just need to clean up the slag and stuff like that so we'll get into that now at the same time we'll flap all of the paint off there's paint on both sides oh didn't know that that was there um, there's paint on both sides that we need to deal with um, get that off and then we're back down to clean stainless that we can work with ground up we're going to start doing some tigging so I've got a new packet of tungstens because I was running low I used the red ones the ones made out of valerian steel so I've got a game of thrones joke there I need to see what I did there Yeah, 
it off here and let them go in. Just look at the ears are tight, but the rest of it's pretty good. This morning's project is basically chopping out a piece of plywood. This is going to be the base for one of the sea berths in the cabin that we've finished off. So I need to cut this out to the right shape, which I'm pretty sure I have now. Give the edges a bit of a quick sand up, clean the whole thing up and then epoxy it and get it ready to go in. And then we'll install it in that bunk. <laughs> Time for some epoxy. So we've sanded this, we've radiused the corners. Um, first coat time, so put that on and then we go through and do a bit more of a clean up. We sort of patch up any areas that we want to fill or anything like that. But yeah, basically this is good enough for the first coat. And we're using epoxy glaze. It's, um, it's basically like a, a commercial grade um, coating for wood floors and things like that in really high traffic areas. But it's, um, yeah, really, it's self leveling and it's pretty hard. So we're going to use that to um, do the sealing of this plywood. And once we've done that, then we're going to um, move on to our top coat, which is a creamy sort of color self leveling paint that we've used on other wood um, with a really good result internally. second coat on that plywood over there but we've got some uh, wood that we're trying something out on this is um, merbau it's basically a poor man's teak but it um, likes to leach the oils and stuff out of the timber um, you can sort of see here we got it a little bit wet and it runs like crazy it leaves these red stains everywhere um, it lasts forever it's a really good outside wood but you just have to put up with that uh, discoloration going onto your you know ground or deck or whatever it is that you're You've got it placed on in this case we're using this in the shower as a, as a test for the wood but we're going to epoxy it and see if we can stop it from leaking because if we can get that to work we're going to use this wood which is a hard wood and very very hard um, we're going to use this wood as uh, frames for our double glazing inside the boat double glazing i hear you say so because we're going to cold places we're going to double glaze um, every window in the boat there's some challenges with that so you can buy windows off the shelf that are double glazed but because we have rounded corners and we're a boat and everything's weird on boats the price is about 47 times more than what you would normally pay for windows on a boat so we're going to build our own what we're going to do bond glass onto the outside of the steel like you'd normally do on a trawler that part's standard the bit that we're doing is bonding a frame on the inside that allows us to bond a second pane onto the uh, onto the frame 
So we're going to be trying Murbau as our frame. We were going to look at doing things like metal and all sorts of stuff, but metal's not great because it's a, it's a good conductor of heat. So if it's cold outside, the metal gets cold all the way on the inside. So we need to stop that. Timber is still considered a thermal bridge in really cold parts of the world. Um, however, and something like plastic would probably be, you know, be the best, but it also has challenges such as you, it's really difficult to bond glass to plastic and things like that. So we're going to go with wood. Um, and we're going to accept that there'll be maybe a 30 mil rim around the glass that is a thermal bridge. However, glass itself is a horrific thermal bridge, so either way, pros and cons. Um, it does mean that we can do it ourselves. The plan is to build a wooden rim with a recess in it, and Murbau is the timber that we're going to work with um, because it's a pretty hardy timber. Being a hardwood, it's something that'll last a long time, particularly if we can get the epoxy working on it um, and if we can keep it sealed up. We've had some advice as to how to paint the epoxy on it. Sand it uh, 15 minutes before you paint it or acetone it 15 minutes, um, you know, no more than 15 minutes before you paint it. And that basically gets rid of the oil on the surface and allows you to put the epoxy on, um, you know, long enough and that oil will creep back out, but it does get the epoxy to seep into the wood deep enough that you can lock that oil back into the timber. Gone through and given it a sand. I'm hoping it's going to be a pretty good test because the frames that I'm going to build will need to be um, sanded, so yeah, that's why I've done it this way, rather than just put the acetone on and see how it goes. I want to kind of have my test as close as I can to what the frames will be. I know it's not going to be perfect because we've got these big lines here where it's really difficult to get um, epoxy into. However, if you noticed, I was painting with a bow wave, so I'm hoping that I've just piled enough down there that it covers it up. Um, it's, yeah, this is a test. It's not going to be perfect. I know this. However, I think what I need to know is if I sand the wood, it really opens up the pores. If you come right down here, you can see just how open those pores are now. They're massive. Um, I need to understand what this wood behaves like when I sand it, acetone it, and then epoxy it, which is going to be exactly our process for using this as frames. We're having to get a bucket load of sand done. Got a lot of blasting to do. So every day we're basically getting up first thing, getting the sand into the buckets or sieved, and then trying to get as much as we can dried out. It's pretty dehydrating weather with all the wind and the sun, which is really good. You can only skim the top half inch off the sand or else it's too wet. Like it looks dry. As soon as you go down below a little bit, it's wet. So we leave it like this so that it, in the sun it bakes and then um, skim the top half inch off, throw it in the buckets and get it into the sieve. In case you're wondering how windy it gets in this yard sometimes, I just watched the wind, I looked up and watched the wind knock over two sets of stairs down the other end of the yard. This is the problem corner that we had. This was the rusty rib that it used to extend right down to the floor and it rusted out piece of the hull just in here and when we plasmid we kind of hacked a little bit over here. Now I've had a bit of a look, here's a piece of wire, if I lay that across you can see that there's probably I don't know three mil disappeared out of there in terms of rust that's probably the worst bit there that's maybe four mil. However it's not like it's a big panel that's a problem it's just this one little bit in here 
So there's a technique that we use to fix very localised rust like this. It's called pad welding. So instead of um, cutting this out, putting a new piece of steel in, it's very difficult to do that because this from here down is on the outside of the hull. Like if you drilled through here, you'd go into open air. And if you drilled from here up, um, the half round on the outside of the boat called the sponson, that's where it's welded onto. So the top of the sponson's here, bottom of the sponson is there. So this part is inside the sponson, this part is outside. So it's a bit of a mission to actually replace this. So what we do is pad weld, we basically just get the MIG welder and we do a big, big old zigzag over this top here and we fill this up and just build the material right back up. So six millimetres is what the hull plate needs to be. Um, you're allowed to go down to five millimetres for survey. This is obviously under five mil, so therefore it wouldn't pass survey theoretically. So we're gonna build this right back up, probably take it up to about 10 mil, something like that. Now we will do it as part of welding this plate in. So the plate that you just saw the sandblast fits in there like that. As part of fitting this back in, we're going to pad weld, we'll weld this in, but we'll also pad weld that piece that was rusted out from the, um, the old rib. Now, the old rib, as you can see here, is a hollow tube. So we have to cap that off. So we're just going to put a, a piece, we'll weld a piece right at the top of that. You can see on the inside, there's still plenty of meat um, here now. It's rusted on the inside, which is normal, but there's still plenty of thickness here. So we're just going to cap that off and leave that as is. It doesn't need to go all the way down because we're putting more steel in than what was originally there by putting this six mil plate in. But James are uh, working through that list, um, uh, which is a big list. Look at you with your safety jandals on. <laughs> oh, it's all right. You got socks. You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Tongs Stuff. for those Australians. Stuff will bounce. Yeah. We we're making a mistake in the description of that. Um, <laughs> um, this plate, of course, comes to here, and it leaves a gap here because we're going to be sandblasting in here. We need a, a way to get the sand and the uh, the water out of this room. Uh, it's a downhill room here, <laughs> so it's going to flow out through the galley kitchen uh, on the side here, um, and, and we'll have a hole cut in the side of the cabin for it to to go out. So yeah, plowing the head of work is brilliant. Flames you can see is the paint burning off. Easy way to join pipes, bit of angle, two clamps, one going in that direction, one going in that direction, and it pulls it down into that corner. Do exactly the same on the other pipe, and you know if they're the same diameter, you've got them lined up exactly where they'll need to be. So if it leaks, it just means that a little bit of um, diesel or oil or whatever is going to dribble out on the outside. It's really not the end of the world. Um, and I don't want to go mental and start pressure testing this and so on. We don't have to do that. So happy with that. It's not going to break and it'll last as long as the boat does. One thing you might have noticed 
this piece of pipe is pre-bent you sort of see along the length of it there um, I, same deal as the last time I used the kink method I didn't want to bother with the sand method um, again it really doesn't matter if we put a few dents in the inside of this pipe I kind of thought about it, the extra hassle and whatever of trying to perfect the sand method versus just bend the damn thing and get it in um, it's going to work fine so that's why we've pre-bent this so when I join them together I've got my pipe ready to go right up the front it's a pretty warm day today we are supposed to get a bucket load of rain over the next few days so we're trying to get the boat watertight before then we've got that pipe to weld into that hole the vent we've also got this one over here which is the old where the vent used to be we're going to seal that up and then down there where you can see the TIG torch sort of hanging over the side of the boat out that hole that's the new filler vent and the pipes sitting there waiting ready to go so we're going to concentrate on this one right now get that welded in and then i'll spin around and we'll get this other vent uh welded in well this is quite a good um example it's pretty windy but it's a little bit hot in the sun so we've got our shade cloths up with our um crane i've jimmied in a piece of steel that steel isn't bending that much it's actually pre-bent it looks really bad because it's going the way that the bend is but under here it gives me a massive big area that's nice and shaded so plenty of wind perfect for welding nice and shaded lovely this is one that jess cut out the other day and we just knocked this five inch hole and i did about 10 seconds of tidy up and look how good that fits beautiful so we're just going to um, TIG this in. I've got everything up here. We'll just blast it in now and get that sealed up. much to the bottom of the tank so we've got a wee bit of alignment to do this is what remains of the old one that was the deck that's above the deck and that's below the deck and there's roughly a gallon of adhesive around this here so I'm thinking they probably didn't do as good a job as they were hoping so I'm hoping that we can do a slightly better improvement on that Okay, well that originally originally that was just for the steering. So we were only doing I think five gallons a minute or something. It was pretty small. Um, yeah. Uh, we're probably not going to be running oil in Antarctica. So um, in order to run in our engines, we have to heat it, heat the oil up to 76 degrees or more to get the same viscosity. Um, but we start up on diesel and stop on diesel. Yeah, there's a couple of things we've got. So we've got basically heating coils in the tanks themselves and we can direct engine coolant into the tanks um to you know to spin around around the pickup and heat up right where the pickup is it had so they had um it was a 400 horsepower main that was basically running like 80 percent throttle for three weeks at a time and they're doing two or three knots pulling nets so they needed and they do it and the water temperature up here is 28 degrees so 
they needed a shitload of cooling to to basically you know get rid of that heat this right right now the the keel cooling pipes are on the boat and they will be cut off before we go to antarctica because they're too exposed so when we when we redesign the system um, we're going to basically build internal cooling we'll build a sea chest that that is cooled sort of inside the boat so ice can't rip it off there's there's going to be a fair bit of experimenting with this like you know we, we don't know what is the optimal setup for it so be handy it's going to be handy as well when we do the sea trials because you're going to be on the boat telling us what to do and it sounds like adrian's driving a truck up full of detroit parts that he can start um fiddling around with the boat as well <laughs> if you haven't been following dengar marine or Stu, my mate he's building a trawler called renko he's a bit of a detroit fanatic and um he's got a mate adrian who's bloody smart at detroit putting it all together for him so that call was them trying to convince me that we should be putting a Detroit into Brewpeg. Admittedly, that's not the only reason they phoned, but I think there was like a hidden agenda there. Cummins versus Detroit. We all know who's going to win that one. In fairness, they did have some pretty good points. They were talking about putting hydraulics into the boat, which we need to. But we also talked about putting hydraulics on the front of the Cummins, which is pretty interesting. Um, probably go that way rather than running it off the generator and then have a separate generator just off to the side and the generator will do an electric get home safe motor um, off the prop shaft so more on that later but interesting thoughts now these vents they have a little wee hole just there like that i like to put that at the very back and that's basically so when you've got this fully closed off the tank can vent only a small amount but enough that it doesn't create pressure or create a vacuum um, and if you forget to open this vent, it allows you to still be able to uh, suck air in while you're steaming along. A little bit of a safety valve. Right, Let's see how good I am. Uh, I'll get this bottom plate welded in. Um, this guy here. So what I've done is I've plasmed it, but I've also put the plasma on an angle and sort of garked out top and then garked out the bottom to account for the angle that that has to sit at. It's not square to the pipe, it sits on an angle. Um, and I've checked it in there and everything and it's pretty, pretty sweet, so I'm happy with that. So uh, if I put this down, I'm 127% guaranteed to drop this into the bottom of the tank and I haven't opened this tank up yet. so. I absolutely don't want to do that, so I'll weld a bit of stuff onto this and then we can just hold it. So that I can get to the back of the weld on this pipe to plate join, I want to leave the pipe not connected to the boat, so that way I can just lift it up and spin it around. So the idea worked pretty awesome. You see that right the way around, we've got a nice pretty chunky bead all the way around. The hard bit to weld is this bit right at the back where you've got a really weird angle when this plate is in and you're trying to weld it in you just simply can't get to it um, but doing it this way which is kind of what i thought would be the case you can get the right right the way around you can be 100 percent confident you've got a beautiful solid weld um, all the way around so yeah pretty stoked with how that worked out so we'll spin this pipe around and get that mounted and then that allows us on the outside of the boat just in front of this little piece you can see going across there that's a washboard to direct all of the wash from the bow over the scupper, but we've got the pipe you can sort of see sticking randomly out the front there. Um, we need to mount that. We've welded the pipe onto the plate, but we haven't welded the plate into the tank. And then also that one at that end is all tacked in. Today's job is go through and weld everything in. Those guys are welded in. Come up pretty clean, I'm happy with that. That one there is pretty, yeah, fine. It's all good. That one there was a bit of a breakfast actually. Um, the steel around the back was rustier than I thought it was going to be. Um, so every time I hit a bit of steel, the um, puddle would always turn to a bit of mush. So I needed to clean it up. So yeah, there was a wee bit of um, clean up to do on that guy. But all up, she's in, it's done. Watertight.
I don't want this pipe. You can sort of see at the moment it's hard over against the edge. I don't want it there. I want to push it back somewhere like that. So I'm going to put it under a bit of tension when I weld it in. Um, yeah, sweet. Just wanted to make sure that that pipe would actually bend. Those are on. Right, that's close enough, we'll weld it in. Let's 